Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. To follow Jesus is not easy. And I know that there may be a lot of new believers here in this room or young in the faith, uh, maybe new families and guests. I uh, just, just want to give you, you know, just a, a heads up that there's things that Jesus says that a lot of people don't know. If you would, turn your Bibles to Matthew 10, and you might have a Bible that is in red like, like mine, and red letter means what? Red letter means Jesus' words. And we talked last week about, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But how many know that that's not the reality for every household? How many know that sometimes it's just me and myself and I will serve the Lord? Sometimes you're in a home where there, there isn't any believer except for you because you chose to follow Jesus and no one else has. Or maybe you and your wife uh, got saved later on in life. You've already been raising your kids for a while and you didn't raise them in God and the kingdom of God in church. And so now you have the difficult task of helping lead your kids to the Lord that don't agree with you. Or it could be a spouse, it could be, it could be that the kid is the only believer and the parents don't believe. Whatever the situation may be, I pray that it would help you, or that I pray that the Holy Spirit would help you apply it today. Because we're in this subject, to finish this series out, I couldn't get, I couldn't get away from the scripture. God kept bringing it to me to preach. And I want to encourage you today and urge you and your families to keep Jesus first in your life. You ready for this? I'm going to say this. Even Jesus over your family. Even Jesus over your family. Buckle up. This will be hard to execute in everyday life. Just like we heard that word today, God has more. But guess what? We're going to have to get rid of some stuff in our life so we can get the more. We have to remove some things that are taking occupancy in our hearts and minds and our schedules so that God can give us what he has for us. In this scripture, the context is this. Jesus is about to send out his disciples on a mission trip. They're practicing, so to say, and Jesus preaches a sermon to them first to help them understand what they might face. And I believe that they would hold on to these words after Jesus died, rose again, and ascended to heaven. They would be on this earth to continue this mission with the help of the Holy Spirit. And I believe the disciples, the apostles, would recall this scripture. And we're going to be in Matthew 10, specifically 32 through 39. Because they're going to be doing some serious work in their, in their uh, mission that God's called them to. So are we. We're called to follow Jesus. And he prepares them for what they may face. And I'm going to read starting with verse 32. Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. That's not good. It, it won't be good to be denied before God by Jesus Christ. We want Jesus to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's what we want Jesus to say. And the way we'll experience that is if we've never denied Jesus while here on earth, and instead we bless his name and we accept him and we glorify him and acknowledge him here publicly on earth. Now, this is where the passage gets even harder. Verse 34, don't imagine that I came to bring peace to the earth. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. Ooh. Let me keep going. I'm going to come back to this for, for teaching wise. I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter in law against her mother in law. Your enemies will be right in your own household. Now that's tough. Wait till the next part. <laughs> I got my car running too, just in case. No, that's true. If you love your father or mother more than you love me, you're not worthy of being mine. Or if you love your son or daughter more than me, you're not worthy of being mine. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy of being mine. If you cling to your life, you will actually lose it. You will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. Wow. Jesus came 
And he actually came to war with wickedness and sin and destroy the works of the devil, according to 1 John 3, 7 and 8. Jesus came actually to fight for us and fight against evil and sin. The problem is not everyone likes his fight against sin. So he does bring peace in this sense. Peace that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, bringing peace or bringing forgiveness between us and God so that we can be at peace with God and be reconciled back to God and have a relationship with him. If you don't have God and you're a sinner, if you don't have Jesus as a Lord and Savior of your life, you are considered an enemy in God's eyes because you are in sin, the scriptures say. But if you believe in Jesus Christ and confess your sins, repent of your sins, you are forgiven and now you are a friend of God, you're a family member of God. Okay, this is scripture. All right, so there's peace with you and God. That's the peace that Jesus came to bring. Why? Because that peace would help you have eternal life, not just peace on earth. Now, you've heard the Christmas song, peace on earth, goodwill to men. And sometimes we interpret that as is that Jesus is just going to bring peace on earth and everyone's going to be good and there's goodwill to all men. But actually, the context of that scripture has been misinterpreted a lot and there's a false notion there. But the reality is the only person who has peace on earth is those who have confessed Jesus as our Lord and Savior. But by the way, even though we do have peace on earth because we have been forgiven for our sin and the, the blood has brought us back to God, even believers are still going to have difficulty. And so we see here that Jesus did not come to bring peace, but he says he came to bring a sword. Well, that isn't necessarily meant to be taken literally here. It's more figuratively to say that Jesus, when he comes, there's going to be conflict. When Jesus works, when his, when his word is preached, when his truth is preached and believed, there will be conflict. Even Jesus himself is not a stranger to that. His own family, according to Mark 3, 21, thought he was crazy. His own family wouldn't believe him. And, and one day some people said, hey, your mother and your brothers are here. They want to see you. And Jesus was like, Anyone who does the will of my father is my brother, my mother, or my sister. So allegiance to Christ is not necessarily blood, or it can be the blood of the lamb, but not human blood. To be, to be a family member of God, we can be a family member of God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And Jesus was saying that my true family are those who believe in God even over my own blood family. And this is, this is radical, okay? We're talking about a culture where family was everything, okay? Especially in the Jewish community and culture. A reverence for mom and dad, okay? Taking care of them if they needed it, all those things. And the Bible even teaches to love your family, to make sure you don't forsake the needs of your own family, okay? And to love your neighbor as yourself. The Bible teaches all that. But Jesus is the only person in the world that can command or call for allegiance to him even above your family members. Jesus is worthy of your love and your allegiance to him even more than your love and allegiance to your family. Now, I didn't hear many amens, but that, just so you know, that, that, that is where we are in Scripture. Okay? <laughs> It won't be easy. As we keep reading through this, you'll see that. As we keep learning and going through life, we'll see that it won't be easy as well. And he says, if you love your father or mother more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. Or if you love your son or daughter more than me, you are not worthy of being mine. Now, all of this is a possibility and potential. And by the way, some of you may even be living this out right now in your own home. And all this is a possibility, but it's not because you and I are being a jerk to our family members. Like we're not supposed to be faithful to Jesus and then being a jerk about it. Can I get an amen? amen. We are to stand loyal with Christ, but do it graciously and gentle. Be gentle and have gentleness with it. But there's gonna be people who disagree with Jesus 
and therefore they disagree with you. And Jesus is warning the disciples that it's even going to be in your own household. He's like, be ready. Be ready for that. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. Now, the cross in the Bible for the Romans represented death. And Jesus is basically using this symbol of death that they would all be familiar with to say, if, you're, if you truly will be my disciple, truly be my follower, you will take up your cross and follow me. You'd be willing to suffer and even possibly die to follow me. The disciples experienced suffering and death because of following Jesus. Now, if they chose not to pick up their cross, they were not worthy of being his follower. That's a tough, that's a tough lesson. Do you know that's the same for us today? That there will be moments where the truth of the word of God, the truth who is Jesus Christ, will be like a sword that causes division even in your own home. And you have to come to a place, a crossroads, where you say, I'm going to be loyal to Jesus or I'm going to be loyal to my family member who disagrees with my faith. And it could come to this place where you have to make a choice. And Jesus is worthy of that. By the way, Jesus is the only perfect person in the world. I don't know about you, but I'm not perfect. My wife knows that. My kids know that. My friends know that. My fellow pastors, family, they know that. I don't know, I don't know any perfect person. So a perfect person person is probably worthy of our allegiance and love. An imperfect person, well, we're going to have to, you got to be careful with that. Jesus is perfect, and he can command this kind of loyalty and allegiance. He gave his entire life for us so that we could have eternal life. I think that's worthy of our love and our loyalty no matter what our family says. Amen. Amen. What Jesus is saying here is, he's not saying don't love your family members. He's saying don't push me in the background or compromise your loyalty to me to love your family members. Love me first and then love them appropriately after that. So let's get into it, applying this to our lives. Number one, and we already know this, Faith in Christ separates his followers from those who follow ungodly ways. The word of God, it cuts and it it splits people. When you choose Jesus, you're choosing to follow him and his truth and his ways. It's naturally going to cause some other people to feel a little weird around you or distant because you're different now. You're no longer following the ungodly things you used to do. Now you're following Jesus who's holy. And so your, your life changes. And so naturally there's this severance and this separation. And people go, you're, you're different. And sometimes they don't like it. They're like, you're weird. You're strange. And they can even persecute you and come at you for it. Jesus said, they hated you because they hated me first. Just so you know. The reason why some people may not like you for following Jesus and being faithful to Jesus, even in your own home, is because they don't like Jesus. So just know that. Secondly, we do need to be prepared to face conflict in our own family for being faithful to him. Jesus, I love this. This is what I love about Jesus. He, and let me remind you, these were his words, not mine. Red letter. He loves you so much, and he loved them so much, he gave them a heads up. He doesn't sugarcoat what it looks like to be a Christian, to be like him, to follow him. He doesn't sugarcoat it. He doesn't oversell it. He's like, it's going to be hard. And it's going to come down to a point possibly in your own family where you have to choose who you will serve and love and follow and condone and celebrate and all those things. Will it be me or will it be them? 
Thirdly, I think there's a misnomer on this, that you have to choose either one. It's not true. You can be loyal to Christ and still love your family. Let me explain, because godly love is allowed to disagree, and it certainly doesn't celebrate sin. Godly love. Here's what I'm trying to say. The world, me, your family, we don't get to decide what love is. God is love. God gets to define what love is. So the, your family member doesn't get to say, you don't love me for not agreeing with me, not condoning me, not celebrating me, not affirming me. You don't love me. They don't get the right to answer or to define, I'm sorry, to define what love is. Only God gets the right to define what love is. We don't get to in, reinterpret what love is. Love is not agreeing with everything. Love is not affirming with everything. God doesn't affirm sin once in Bible. You will not find God affirming or celebrating or liking and loving and sharing posts in the Bible. There is no social media in the Bible. You know what I'm saying. You won't find God encouraging people to live their sinful lifestyle. So why would we do that with our kids? Why would we do that with our spouses? Why would we do that with our parents? Are we afraid to lose them? You might lose them. But it's not because you were a jerk. It's because you trusted and believed in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It's because you believe in the truth. And in fact, to disagree would be to love your family member because now you're not going to confuse them because maybe one day they read the Bible and see the truth and they go, well, wait a second, my mom or dad, they said they're a Christian, but they're saying I'm okay doing what I'm doing. But meanwhile, the Bible says it's not okay. So who should I listen to? And guess what they'll choose? They'll usually choose the family over the Bible. That's why we must stand strong in a gracious way in a loving way, and stand for the truth and, and love, love them in the truth so that one day when they come back, they see that they were wrong and the word of God was right. Now, I'm going to get more on that here in a minute, okay? Now, in the Bible, it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the first commandment. The second commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. Do you see the flow there? that we're called to be loyal to God in our love, but sometimes that's challenged by our family members. And we think that we, we're supposed to just love everyone because the Bible says it's a command, love everyone. You're right, but it, again, it does not mean that we have to agree with what they're doing. Uh, family members, and I'm, I'm gonna talk to parents mainly here. Please be careful that you don't allow your family member who opposes God to influence you. Be careful. I know your love, your faith. I love my kids. I love my kids so much I would do anything for them except lie to them. Except confuse them. Except allow them to go down a path and never say nothing. That's, that path that's wrong and say nothing because I don't want to offend my kid. I want them to love me still. Now, listen, I actually don't need my kid's love. God loves me already. God loves me already. He gave his life for me. My kids have not done that. And by the way, he rose again. They haven't, and they won't. <laughs> Mom and dad, your kids are not your best friends. They're your kids. They're your kids. You were called to guide them into all truth, which, by the way, the Holy Spirit does for you. So now let the Holy Spirit do that for them. But as parents, your responsibility is to guide them into the truth of the Holy Spirit, the truth of the Word of God, the truth of Jesus Christ. That is your job. Your job isn't to get them to love you more, and they start making choices that are wrong, and, and you're like, yeah, you know, I still love you. It's okay. You're doing good. No. If my kid was playing in the road, I would say something, especially in oncoming traffic. 
That's love. That's love, church. So we need to live and speak, live and speak the truth in love. So let me, let me focus on live real quick. We need to live and speak the truth in love. And the reason why is because we might say something, but our life says another. And the kids see right through that. We stand for the Lord, we're loyal to Jesus, but we're a jerk to our kids or our family members, that is not biblical. We're, we're hurting our spouse, that's not biblical. Our kids are watching how we treat each other in our marriages. They see how we treat our neighbors, they, they hear how we talk about them. Live the truth and then speak the truth in love. So here's some things that I would say to my kids if they were going down a wayward path. I love you, I really do but I do not love what you are doing or the path you are going in. I love you, but, I'm, but not the choices that you are making. I love you too much to agree or celebrate with these choices in your life. Because I love you, I'm being honest with you. What's wrong with saying that? What happened? Where, why can't we do that? Well, because sometimes our affection for our kids is greater than our affection for Jesus Christ. Amen. And we need to come back to being loyal to Christ. Yes, loyal to Christ. And that's my fourth point. Faithfully love and pray for your family while you remain loyal to Christ. You don't make a hard stand and then be, be like not loving and caring. You still nurture, you still love, you still care for your family members, whatever it may be. Again, put yourself in the shoes that you need to. If you're the kid and your parents aren't serving the Lord, then put yourself and apply this to your life, okay? Uh, this will be the hardest thing you will face. It has to be. I'm a dad. I'm a dad. If, if, I, was in, if I was in the shoes where my, my son or daughter was wayward, and I pray it never happens, but if I was in their shoes, in their shoes I would, this would be hard, Okay, let's just be real, right? It's key that you stay strong, that I stay strong in loyalty to Christ, but gracious in our approach so that your family can come back to you because you were gracious when they left or when they disagreed. When you disagreed, you, you season it with grace, okay? You're not, you're not mean about it, okay? You're not brutal about it. And by the way, if your wayward family member does come back to the Lord, do not say, I told you so. <laughs> come on. <laughs> told you I was right. Oh, that's just painful to say right now. You know why? It's not about you. you, you your kid doesn't need you more than anything else. Your kid needs God more than anyone else. To be fair, like let's be fair. We're saying that we're saying to our family that we need God more than them. Well, same thing for you then. When they come back, they need God more than you. So don't be like, I told you so, I knew it, yeah, yeah. No, just celebrate that they're back to God. Or they're starting that journey again because they deconstructed or they went off the path. And so we don't rub it in their faces, we just we, cut, we start loving them right again. Let's think about the prodigal son story for a moment. You know the story. The prodigal son thought, you know, it's time for me to live up life a little bit. This is a, this is a parable. This isn't a literal story, but it can represent a lot of people's lives. It has been a lot of people's testimonies. So the father allows the son to leave with his inheritance early, which is just wrong. It's an insult, too, to take it that early. And the son leaves, and he wastes it all on wild living. He realizes what he had done wrong, probably around the time when he's eating out of a pig trough or trying not to. And he realizes, I could go home and I have so much more. But he, he realizes he sinned against God and his family. He comes back, and the scriptures say that the father was looking on the horizon, in other words, anticipating his return. That is love to allow sometimes our family members to go on their wayward way and not force them to stay 
But to allow it to happen, I know that is very painful to do. I, I, that would be my struggle. Okay, I'd probably fight for my kid first, just so you know, <laughs> and tell them every reason why they shouldn't go that way. And we don't have that whole story because it's a parable teaching a simple lesson, okay? But to watch a family member leave, that, the love that we're supposed to show is we wait and pray and ready to love them as soon as they come back. When they truly are remorseful, when they're truly sorry, they come back and they own it all. They realize they sinned against God and mom or dad or family member, whatever your situation is, you say, welcome home. I'm glad you're back with God. Amen. That's love. Amen. It wasn't to go with him. It was to stay. Why? Let me give you a theory of my own. There are many ways to heaven, apparently. Quote, unquote, right? It's false. When you stay faithful to the Lord and your kid or wayward family member realizes it, it helps them know the one way back in the midst of all the other ways. Clear, concise path, the narrow path back. The path of Jesus Christ is the way back home. Not Hinduism, not Buddhism, not anything else. It's Jesus. That's why we must stay faithful. And that brings me to my last point. Our faithfulness to Jesus could be a lifeline for our lost family members. Now, let me make sure I make myself clear here. You're not Jesus, so you're not saving your kids. You're not the lifeline. It's a lifeline to Jesus. Okay? And your faithfulness could be what marks the path of your child or your family member knowing how to get back to God. You know why? They watched you be faithful your entire life. Right now, there's a lot of bad things happening in our world, but there's actually a lot of good coming out of it too. Because as the world crumbles, people are actually running to God right now going, he is the only way. Like nothing else has worked. No other gods are causing miracles to happen. No other gods are telling the truth. Money isn't working. My position isn't working. My, my athleticism isn't working. Any other false gods we've created isn't working. Church, there are people coming to Jesus in droves right now across this nation and around the world in the midst of bad and chaotic times. I want, and, and I, this, this isn't, I believe this won't be my kid's life, but I want it to be so clear. I want to be so faithful to Jesus that when everything starts crumbling in, in someone's life, they know exactly the way back because they've watched me be consistent. That brings me to the, to the last part of this point. Your faithfulness could help my kid one day. My faithfulness could help your kid. Why am I saying that? Did you know that a lot of people I help come back to the Lord? They've come back not because of their family members, but because of a church member. In other words, when you live the life, you're actually helping reinforce what I said to my kid. You're proving it too. When, when a whole church is living the same way, when the whole church is living in the truth, eventually sometimes our family members can't deny the truth anymore. Oh man, they're, they're experiencing the same thing my parents are experiencing, my whatever it may be. Your faithfulness may help one day another person come back to God and their family. It actually might bring peace to their relationship with God and peace in their own home. So church, there's a, there's a responsibility on us to make sure that we don't condone sin in people's lives, in our family lives, that we don't celebrate it, that we stay faithful and graciously do that because it could actually lead other people back home to God and even their family. In fact, that's the majority of my experience. It wasn't mom or dad who convinced the kid. It was someone else in the church. And it wasn't even them. It was the Holy Spirit. You see, while, while the, your kid is gone and you're praying, or while your family member is gone and you're praying, the Holy Spirit is working on their hearts. I'm gonna, we're going to pray in a moment, but one of the prayers that I pray, okay, is, is, is pretty strong prayer for people that I see go wayward and go lost. And it doesn't always work. I have to be honest with you, it doesn't always work. Sometimes it does. I pray these prayers. 
Lord, let the world, the things and the pursuit they believe is right be wrecked and crumble if it leads them back to you. Now, I didn't say destroy them. That wouldn't be biblical. That would not be praying and loving your enemies, okay? Or whatever else, whoever else. That just wouldn't be loving. What I'm saying is the lies that they've trusted in, the false gods that they've trusted in, I'm asking God to destroy that relationship, to to wreck that relationship, to humble them. Because if that's what it takes for them to come running back home like the prodigal son, then that's what I want. Because it's better to lose your life here on earth for the sake of Jesus Christ than to gain the whole world and lose your soul. I'd rather them have nothing left except Jesus Christ. Because if you have Jesus, you have everything. You have everything you need. Why don't we stand together and close? Because we're going to turn this whole room into an altar to pray for our family members. God's not done building your family. The blueprints are still under construction. I have hope that your family members could still come to the Lord. Because it's happening in this sanctuary, in this lobby, in our offices. It's happening online on a regular basis. People are giving their life to Christ. Who knows? Someone's watching YouTube sermon in Delaware. They live in Texas and they come running back to God and go running back to their family saying, I got saved through a guy in Dover, Delaware, (laughs) through a sermon I heard. Do you know that happens? It's wild. Technology has turned the tables on the gospel getting out. You know why? Because Jesus is coming back soon. So his message is getting out. (laughs) Amen. God is using the, the internet and using online churches to reach thousands of people a year. And so I, I, I believe that your family, first of all, I believe that your family who is lost and wayward, I'm going to use this term, I never used it before, they're savable. Okay? Don't lose hope. But be clear and concise in your life. Follow Jesus. Don't confuse him. Don't confuse them by going back and forth. You heard it in the word from our brother today, and we heard it in the first one too. Worship him alone. Choose to have more from God, not this world. Who is it that we need to pray for today? Why don't we bow our heads, close our eyes? I mean, think of the person that you would think would never get saved. Jesus' blood is more, is, is more powerful than sin and death. Jesus shed his blood for the whole world, not just a part of it, for the whole world. Who is it that needs to be saved? Maybe you've given up praying for them. Don't. Let this message today remind you his love is greater. Let's cry out to God. Lord, oh God, we love, we love you. We love you, God, and help us to love you more, Lord. Help us to love you appropriately, Lord, to love you first, to seek first your kingdom. Lord, we thank you that you love us. We know what love is because you first loved us, and you are love. God, you define what love is. God, we thank you for how you've loved us. God, we plead the blood of Jesus Christ over our family members we're thinking about right now. The ones who've opposed us, the ones who don't like us, to those who are just not really choosing a side. They're not angry with us. They're not mad with us. There's no conflict, but they're not choosing Jesus. We pray for both. God, we plead the blood of Jesus over them, that the blood will break the bondage that the devil has put over them, that sin has the bondage of sin in their life, that you would remove the scales from their eyes to see Jesus in us. They would see why we're being loyal and faithful because you are loyal and faithful, that, God, they would be, they'd be drawn to your glory, not ours, and that it wouldn't be always just our walk. It would really be the walk of Jesus Christ in us, 
that it would be Jesus moving and working through our words and our love and our living, Lord, speaking the truth and living the truth in love. God, we pray that you would open their eyes, most of all, to your word, Lord, because it's the gospel that saves, not us. Lord, I pray that you would soften hearts to receive your words, to receive your presence, to receive your love, your forgiveness, Lord. Soften hearts to repent, to turn back to you, God. People that we would never think would come to you, God, we pray right now in Jesus' name, or we ask you, Lord, to save that person, that father, that mother, that son or daughter, that parent, that spouse. Lord, we know you can do it. God, rescue them from this world. As Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil and sin, and to give us life everlasting, God, I pray that would be the destiny of these family members. And Lord, forgive us as a church, as, a, as the body of Christ, as a, as a faithful parent or, or child, for not being honest or for succumbing under that, that pressure to just approve or condone or celebrate things that are wrong in our family members' lives. God, I pray you would, you would give us the strength to be strong and courageous. Lord, help us to know how to speak the truth in love, to care for them enough to be honest. Help us to season our speech and, our, and the gospel with the salt and light, with the grace. Lord, the, the word of God is already strong. Lord, help us to just let you do the conviction Help us to just deliver the word, deliver the truth, and let your spirit convict. So God, help us, and may they receive it the way they need to receive it, Lord. Lord, help us, because we can't control people's reactions to even a gentle plea for their salvation or a gentle concern. We can't control their reactions. So God, work in the midst of those situations. Lord, we thank you. You called us to love you and love everyone else. But Lord, we choose to make sure we stay faithful to you and not compromise our relationship with you, even if it means with a family member. Lord, we pray that we could be a lifeline to another family who needs their son or daughter to come home or their father or mother, their spouse, whatever the situation may be. Lord, I pray that we could be a light as well, that we could be ready to help. Thank you, God, that you're not done saving yet. You're still reconciling. You're still building our family. Lord, bring the prodigals home. We love you, God. And we're going to ask you to do something that's really hard to do. God, we're going to, well, we're going to do something that's really hard to do. <laughs> but we're going we're gonna to trust you. We're going to trust you when we're scared, when we're starting to wonder if it's working, if our prayers are working, if they're going to change. God, we do ask that you would help us to trust you. Remind us of your faithfulness. Remind us that your spirit is working even when we don't see it, you are working. We thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. We love you, God. We give you all the glory and praise for the testimonies that would come out of this message. And Lord, again, give us the grace to struggle with this message and apply it to our lives. Help us, Lord, because it won't be easy. We love you, God, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.